I would like to welcome Russell Miller to the conference. Thank you. And um, thank you, the organizers of Black Dance, inviting me here today. Uh, thank you to John A. Jack, who's a great help in my book. And uh, welcome to all those who I hope are watching this online, although they have a guarantee of my mouth. Oh, um, I think the people in this room who know a lot more about Scientology than I do, and I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about Elder Ron Hubbard, who uh, I might know a little bit more about, but not a good deal, I guess. Um, I should tell you, uh, first of all, perhaps how this book uh, came about. I was working for the Sunday Times in London, and um, Hubbard had gone missing in, in uh, 1980, I think it was. He disappeared off the radar. Nobody quite knew uh, what had happened to him, why he had gone, and, uh, and where he was. And I suggested to the editor of the Sunday Times, um, these were days when newspapers had large budgets, and you could pick up do what you like. I said, let's See if we can find Elder Ron Hubbard. And if we can find him, we have a great scoop. If we can't find him, then we've got an even greater scoop. So either way, we work. And um, I was in America uh, frequently in those days. Um, and I got, I knew he was in California. And uh, the source of the Church of Scientology told me that a messenger went up every day to where he was. And I knew the messenger took a certain length of time to make the journey. And I drew a circle around Los Angeles, and I was pretty sure he was in the north, and he wasn't far from San Luis Obispo. Exactly. That's where he was, not far from San Luis Obispo. And I was feeling particularly pleased with myself when a few weeks later I was at home in England, and uh, news came on the radio that the government had died. This was terrible timing for me because my story fell apart. However, I, by then, by that stage, learned a lot about this extraordinary gentleman. And um, I decided I'd continue the work, which is what I did. Um, I want to start at the beginning because, um, in my view, uh, a lot can be understood and explained about Scientology by the nature of its rather well, extraordinary founder. Uh, and I think the key to understanding is to look at his early life. Um, I want to bring to your attention some of the elaborations that the church put upon the founder's biography. Um, and according to the church, Ron grew up in his grandfather's enormous cattle ranch, which covered a quarter of the state at the time, huge. Um, he was friends with countrymen, cowboys, and Indian medicine men. And I quote from the church's official biography, long days were spent riding breaking on her broncos, hunting coyote, and taking his first steps as an explorer. In Montana, he became a blood brother of the Blackfoot Indians. And he joined the family at the age of 10. Uh, his father put him on a course of intense instruction. By the age of 12, he had already read a goodly number of the world's greatest classics. I have to tell you, and I don't suppose this is any news for any of you, that this is all utter nonsense. <laughs> None of it is true. The truth was that Rob actually had an extremely uh, conventional, comfortable, low middle class uh, upbringing in Montana, loving family. Uh, his grandfather was not a wealthy rancher, but um, he was a small time veterinarian in Nebraska. Uh, his father served in the U.S. Navy and quite a rank in various medium jobs, and his mother was a teacher. For much of his childhood, Ron lived in the kind of fantasy world that he would recreate when he was um, writing science fiction. He, he wrote any short stories, usually sort of blood and thunder, adventure stuff, involving pirates and cowboys and all and stuff. He kept a journal on which he was already elaborating his life. A few days after his 13th birthday, he was made an Eagle Scout. And in typical Ron fashion, he wasn't satisfied with being made an Eagle Scout. He would make an Eagle Scout, the youngest Eagle Scout in the country, the youngest Eagle Scout ever. 
considered a cheap thing anyway. But um, when I actually called the uh, Boy Scouts Association of America, and I said, uh, was Ron Hubbard in the sky? He said, yeah, what? He looked at him, and I was was he in the sky? I said, um, and was he the youngest in the sky? He said, we have no idea. We don't keep a record of the age, so we have no idea whether he was the youngest or not. But the man of rock, he, he, um, he made the claim, believed in himself, I think. And then Mr. Temple is alleged one of I'm going to read you a, a small passage from my book, if you forgive me. I read this book a long time ago, so probably it's gone from my uh, pen. At age 14, it seems to me Christopher Ladd could be found wandering the Orient alone at the age of 14, investigating primitive cultures, learning the secrets of life from gurus and wise men in the East. In China, he met an old magician whose ancestors had served in the field of Kuba Khan. He lived in Tibet with bandits who accepted him because of his honest interest. In the remote reaches of Western Manchuria and Pacific, the fearless boy calms the natives by exploring a cave which is supposed to be haunted. Now you can get the drift of this stuff. I mean, this is, this is pure uh, fiction before science fiction. And uh, <laughs> it's, 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 it's wonderful stuff, except it's not going to be true. There appeared to be no limits to the young man's abilities. I remember one night learning Igoro Igorogi, an Eastern primitive language in a single night. I sat up by a parish in Mountain and took a list of words that had been made by an old mission that goes and moves on. The Igorogi were very simple language. The missionary phoneticized the language and made a list of their main words and their uses in grammar. And I remember sitting up and there were all the and learning the language, 300 words, and memorizing these words what they meant. And the next day, I started getting in mind and reminding other people. And I was speaking the words in a very short time. Isn't it amazing? Actually, at the age of 14, he wanted never been born in his life. He never experienced any kind of these mystic cultures. He knew nothing, but he knew it all up here in his mind. When he was 14, he lived in Brereton, and his father was back in the Navy, he was stationed in Puja and Navy. South Navy Shipyard. According to the church, Ron spent the years from 1925 to 1929 traveling through Asia financed by his wealthy grandfather. Actually, his grandfather this was recently on bus, so there was no welfare at all. Ron's travels through Asia extended to no more than two visits to Guam, where his father had been posted, during one of which he took a recreational trip to China, which included 10 days sightseeing in Peking. That was Peking. And that was the closest he ever got to Tibet. The church says he enrolled at George Washington University as a student in one of the first nuclear physics courses ever taught at an American university. Actually, his major is civil engineering. Now we come to the Caribbean Motion Picture Expedition, which won then by the university in 1931, and which later provided fascinating, vital, and valuable research for the University of Michigan and underwater films for the Hydrograph Office. Well, I found the truth about the Soviet expedition in the early copies of the university newspaper, The Hatchet, in Washington. Ron had indeed chartered a schooner, uh, the Doris Hammond, which sailed from Baltimore to replenish uh, water, Baltimore, bound for the pirate wars of the Caribbean. And after stopping the Bermuda to replenish water supplies, seven of the gentlemen adventurers who joined them could jump ship. They had enough of Ron. And uh, by the time they arrived in Martinique, where uh, Ron admitted the expedition had insufficient funds to pay the crew, Captain Garfield, his skipper, came to the ship's owners uh, that the charm fees would risk, and the owners ordered the ship to return to the Captain Garfield, when he returned to Baltimore, said that his trip was the worst voyage he'd ever encountered in his entire career. But Ron, of course, was completely unwanted. For him, the uh, expedition was an unqualified success, as you'll see from how he described it himself. <coughs> Although the expedition was a financial failure, 
but nevertheless, the inventors and scientific names to accomplish were well compensated for the financial deficit. Among the scientific accomplishments was the correction of the radio specimens of flora and fauna from the University of Michigan, some of them very rare, the provision of underwater films to the hydrographic office, and much research work into the field of natural life, while the various islands. The New York Times has reported had already bought some of the photographs taken on the expedition. Again, we're talking total, total fiction. None of this was true. I checked with the hydrographic office, I checked with the University of Michigan, I checked with the New York Times. None of them knew anything about the fate of the expedition. Ron dropped out of the university and became a science fiction writer. Um, although the church later claimed he led three expeditions in Central America to undertake a study of savage people and cultures and provide material for writing. Between 1933 and 1941, he visited many barbaric cultures, this is the church school, and yet found time to write seven million words, seven million words of published fact and fiction. Well, in those years, seven million words, I can't work it all out, didn't take long, would have been impossible. Each article would have been an impossible 44,000 words. Now, my friend Swim will back me up here. 45,000 words is a lot for an article. It's such a lot that um, it's completely impossible to do. At the same time as he writing 44,000 words, he um, was studying barbaric cultures. Uh, the truth was he never left North America and studied no popular cultures apart from those perhaps to be found in New York or Sanders. In the interim, he made the qualifies as a pilot. Amazing man. <laughs> made an appearance in Who's Who. And the pilot, the magazine for aviation personnel, which further expanded his career. If you give me, I'll just uh, get into that little okay. thing. I love this guy. I mean, he's, a, he's a dream for a lot of because <laughs> so much material. This is the, um, uh, a writer for the pilot describing Hubble. Whenever two or three pilots are gathered together around the nation's capital, whether it be a congressional hearing or just, back from, just in the back of some kind, you'll probably hear of this guy, Ron Hubble. He's mentioned such an adjective as crazy, wild, dizzy, for the flaming hand pilot. Hit the city like a tornado a few years ago, and made women scream, and strong men weep by his aerial antics. <laughs> it is there at the ground of the mission. One could do more stunts in a sail plane than most of the pilots could do in the pursuit of a job. He'd come over space from an altitude of 30 inches, and thumb his nose at the undertakers who used to come out to the field of Tito. Now, this is a remarkable achievement that Ron actually hadn't qualified as a pilot. Nevertheless, his, uh, his, his uh, memory served him well. Now, we come to the really formal subject of Ron's war uh, This is a pivotal moment in, in his career, and a pivotal moment actually in uh, the church's biography of Ron because he emerges as an extraordinary hero. He served in the North Flag Theatre of War. He worked behind the lines, exhibiting extraordinary courage. He earned 24 medals for his daring and daring do. And uh, the such of his service that the Secretary of the Navy flew him back to the United States, his own private plan, in recognition of uh, his great achievements. Well, again, I have to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, that you won't be so surprised to hear that um, none of this is true. <laughs> Ron's Navy career was indeed remarkable, but it was remarkable for its shortcomings and for the eccentricity of uh, Ron himself. He was he somehow by commission, which is yeah, achieving a I suppose. Um, but by, it's by examining his later career that we can get a real insight into the serial fantasies that was going on. I obtained from the uh, Navy Department 
freedom, yes, the freedom of information, the information act, runs entire war service. It's a pile of, I think, between 1,500 and 2,000 pages. Extremely detailed. It, um, it uh, gave you every station that uh, have been to, everything ever done. It included letters from tailors who were chasing the ability to have pay. Uh, it included details of the reports of inquiry that were uh, convened to discuss what this young officer had been doing. And um, it by and large concluded that um, Lieutenant Hubbard of the US Navy was um, not just a hero, but was an extraordinary liability. He was commissioned on the 19th of July, and uh, so it's all given a series of office jobs uh, in the US Navy Reserve. Um, and then he spoke to the Philippines, uh, but stopped on the way in Australia, where he had to wait for the ship to take him further to uh, uh, further on to Philippines. Uh, and um, while he was in Australia, uh, he managed to antagonize his uh, commanding officer, uh, who sent him straight back to the uh, United States with um, a note saying, I can find it in my notes, that he was uh, utterly unsuitable, unsuitable and very full of himself. Which I think um, it tells us quite a bit about. One. Uh, so he got back to the United States um, and was amazingly given the command of the gunboat, uh, the USS YP, Yankee Papa 422. And um, uh, this boat was um, going to make his career. And for the first time, he was in command of his the boat, and um, uh, he was going to be a hero. Well, Something happened, it's not clear what in the record, but um, before the white P-42 set out on a uh, shakedown cruise, its commander was somehow not being relieved of his command, and you um, don't quite know why, but he had. He was then sent to the submarine chaser center in Miami, where he arrived wearing dark officers, and explained to him that he had that while serving the double officer on the destroyer head store, he had been sent in two places to fight each gun, which he fired prematurely and left him unable to cope with right um, He was persuaded by his impressive shipmates to talk about his adventures. And uh, on the day of the harbor, uh, Ron had been landed from the Exor on the north coast of Java to carry out a secret mission about which he obviously couldn't talk, so secret. And when the Japanese occupied the island, he took the pills and lived rough in the jungle for several months. Once he was called support by a Japanese patrol and managed to escape, although when he was fleeing from the Japanese patrol, he was hit in the back by a machine gun, survived miraculously. <laughs> then, with another officer, he built a raft, sailed across the Timor Sea, infested with sharks, and eventually was picked up by a British destroyer. Fantastic, fantastic. And, you know, you should make this with this, with open mouths. What an amazing man this was. I mean, how could he do all these? It's incredible. Absolutely incredible. And the extraordinary thing was, they believed him. Yeah. You know, he, could, he could tell the story so wonderfully well, but they all believed him. You know, that, you know how uh, fetched the stories and how varied they were and how, how little they could actually fit in with the reality of his life, um, he could carry them off. So, anyway, he's back after all these adventures in the United States, and now he's the commander of another ship. I don't know what the US Navy was thinking about, but um, anyway, it was this one, the submarine chaser, USS Power Charlie 815, New York Coast, in Portland, Oregon. Uh, he was photographed by the Portland, Oregon, on the bridge of his new ship, and described as a veteran sun hunter. Well, a veteran sun hunter of the battles of the Pacific and the Atlantic, an old hand of knocking off the tails of enemy stars. <laughs> On the 18th of May, PC815 sailed on a shakedown cruise, and um, on the shakedown cruise, he encountered in the Pacific Pacific, just off the west of the uh, coast of Mexico, he encountered not one, but two Japanese submarines, two enemy submarines across his path, and he began a fierce battle. His, his ship was forging back and forth across the Pacific, dropping a death shot after death shot. 
Two bombs of this ship were pulled in, pulled into the ocean. Four other ships were pulled in to support this incredibly heroic battle. And the extraordinary thing was that Ron could see the evidence of the submarines, of the boiling oil coming out from the sea, with bits of debris. It was not quite a periscope, it was like a periscope, but it wasn't a periscope. And do you know what the observation blinks and the other four ships could see? They couldn't see any different them. As far as they were concerned, there was nothing there. And off they went. They went home. Ron was still convinced that um, he had uh, sunk, if not one, but certainly two submarines. His ship dropped 100 depth charges. The other ships dropped none. And the investigation later concluded that um, Commander Ron Hubbard had probably mistaken a known magnetic deposit in the area as a signal from the sun. So Lieutenant Hubbard was able to fought a heroic battle against the magnetic deposit. Heroic was the result. Worse was the time. On the 28th of June 1943, PCA 15 unknowingly strayed into Mexican territorial waters. The navigator presumably wasn't uh, paying attention to his charts. The ship got into navigation Mexican territorial waters, and Ron decided that the men was right for the like practice. So they were just off the Coronados Islands, and the ship fired on the Coronados Islands, essentially fired on Mexico. There was, of course, uh, consequences. Mexico lodged an official complaint. And Ron was admonished by the Board of Investigation and relieved of his command again. His fitness report noted that he was below average and considered this officer lacking in the essential qualities of judgment, leadership, and cooperation. This, don't forget, we're talking about this extraordinary hero that the church uh, described. Uh, he was then posted to temporary duty at headquarters of the District, Naval District of San Diego, where he reported sick with a variety of ailments ranging from malaria, how he could contract malaria and those, to a degree and also to pains in his back. And he remained in hospital for three months. He wrote home to say to Ron that he had been injured when he picked up an unexploded shell on the deck of his destroyer and threw it over the side and just exploded. Uh, in mid-air before the leadership. In December 1943, he was placed as a navigating officer on the U.S. Uh, now, obviously, I never got the as navigating officer straight into Mexican territorial waters, fired on Mexico, and created an official complaint. Um, but he, for the first six months, he remained in Portland while his ship was being fitted out. Uh, but when it seemed she was about to be sent to the Pacific to engage in actual warfare, uh, Ron suddenly decided he would apply for a course at the School of Military Government in Princeton. Uh, obviously, being Ron, he said that he started at Princeton University. Actually, he went to the School of Military Training, the School of Military Government. Um, when he arrived at the School of Military Government, you could, you could think about this for a moment and say, well, then why did he, he want to go with this ship to the Pacific, where the uh, United States were engaged in a vicious war against the Japanese, and you, you might possibly, I, I, I couldn't um, anticipate your thoughts, but you might think for a moment he was trying to get out of his own active service, and maybe he wasn't quite as courageous as the Church seemed to have, of course, just as just. Uh, anyway, when he arrived at the School of Military Government, um, he uh, explained he couldn't walk far, as both his feet had been broken when his last ship had been bombed. Um, and he had a extraordinarily busy war. Four ships had been sunk under him. He told the school, and of course they were all fully After completing a four month course, he was transferred to Monterey, California for further training, uh, which is where he was when Japanese, the Japanese surrendered. And now I want to draw your attention to a small passage in my book, which will um, describe his view of. Uh, where he was at this time. The moment when the Japanese signed the surrender, 
One was a link which is a local nation hospital in Oakland. None of the results of the correct war rooms, but to be treated for epigastric distress, which is a bit of uh, potential food loss. And it was in this rather glorious situation that the um, war ended for him. Uh, but his version was slightly different, as I now described. Blinded with injured optic, optic nerves, and laying with injuries to hit them back. At the end of World War I, World War II, I faced an almost non existent future for China. I was abandoned by family, and Fred was a, a supposedly hopeless cripple, and probably a burden in geology. I became used to being told it was all impossible, that there was no way, no hope, yet I came to see and walk again. Which was not tremendously surprising as he wasn't blind and he wasn't crippled. Oh, <laughs> don't you notice it did kill him. His own accounts obviously um, would make his um, award of 24 medals justly deserved. But um, unfortunately, his US Navy record in the war to everyone who had served at the time of World War the American Campaign Medal awarded to everyone who was in the service, the Asia, Asiatic Pacific Campaign Medal, and the World War II Victory Medal, uh, which was received by everyone in BJ. So here is a man uh, that was able to parlay his frankly disgraceful war record into something very, very extraordinary and everyone could do it. <laughs> the next few years, Ron was back to the force of Veterans Administration to um, try and get pension. Uh, he, he showed up in offices um, with a variety of complaints, presumably whatever he thought would catch the attention of uh, the medics or examining him. Sometimes he was crippled, sometimes he was blind, sometimes he suffered extraordinary gunshot wounds, and sometimes they were sort of accidents like the fall of the ladder. On the 19th of September, he limped into the VA Medical Center in Los Angeles with a miserable machine, but by now familiar with events. I was sensitive to bright light, and I can't read very much, and I have severe headaches. My stomach trouble picked me up a good part of the night, and I kept on a very rigid diet. I could only eat milk, eggs, ground meat, and strange vegetables. <laughs> I tired quickly and become nauseated when I woke up. My left shoulder, hit, in fact, the entire left side of my body is bothered with arthritic pains. Arthritic pains. I can't sit for any long length of time with typewriter breaks. Actually, by then he was writing his science fiction novels and he was sitting at his desk for hours and hours every day. Even when he was writing science fiction, he couldn't resist the temptation to further aggrandize his life. And he wrote a, a, a piece for a science fiction magazine in the third person and um, mentioned that um, uh, as the third person he had come across. I recall that in 1930, Errol Hubbard, a writer and engineer, developed and tested, but without fanfare, the rocket motor considerably superior to the V2, oh but with an instrument of propulsion which was rather less complicated. What we're dealing with here, as I'm sure you will now see and I hope you can, is a charismatic, confident serial fantasist, wow. incapable of separating fact and fiction. My point is this, at any time during his life, Elrond Hubbard could have set the record straight. At any point he could have done this. Uh, he could have passed off the, the lies and the embellishments and the ridiculous stories as youthful mistakes and present himself in his true colors. He chose never to do that. And um, every time he was interviewed by um, uh, newspapers, he would add more, uh, more accomplishments to 
his extraordinary career. I mean, at one point, he was doing, and they mentioned that he was also, um, yeah, he was a writer, of course, a war hero. He was a crewman, that's right, he was a crewman, and um, a, a top sergeant in the Marines as well. To me, on the top of this. And, and every newspaper was doing him, he had a little bit to the story of his life. It's um, extraordinary that he would do this. I mean, he even lied in his own childhood diary when, when he was a small boy. He, he finished off a, a little short story he was writing um, and said, um, uh, I'll tell you the secret of this strange life I had. I was born on Friday the 13th. He wasn't. <laughs> 13th of March, 1911 was a Monday. Wasn't Friday the 13th. But there, 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 nothing you do about it. Absolutely nothing you do about it. Now, the, the church might argue, um, with perhaps some validity, that perhaps none of this matters. Perhaps his accomplishments in founding the Church of Scientology and uh, Dianetics and all the other things that the church is now famous for overcomes these blips in his personal life. I do not support this argument. Uh, it seems to me that a man who is prepared to lie about himself consistently throughout his entire life is a man that you would have difficulty in trusting. If you can't trust the Bible, what can you, what does it say about the doctrine of the Church of Scientology? What does it say about the ordeal that people are undergoing? in the church, day by day, of which everybody here knows a lot, and many stories that um, I haven't heard and would like to hear one day. So I don't think we should treat this lightly. I don't think we should say, well, you know, there are people who read my book, and he was funny. The second time around, I thought it was standing funny. But in some ways it is funny, but it's serious too. This man is the Messiah for the Scientologists. He, he founded this enormous organization. And the people who are here tonight oppose this organization and wish to build and I support them. Because uh, in my view, the, what might have started off as something worthwhile, a simple form of psychotherapy, or, uh, helping people, um, I don't believe Incidentally, the other had this view that he was happy he started to help people. I believe he started it to make money. And he said the way to make money, real money, is to start a religion. And, you know, I don't, I don't trust uh, Albert at all. And, you know, the later part of his life, and the seal, taking this whole church to see in his old dust buckets, um, sailing around the Mediterranean, looking for a buried treasure. Um, I'm sure you know that when the seal was birthed in Corfu, they would have a parade on the after deck every morning. And those people that had committed some sin on the previous deck, their names were called. Two thugs took them each side by arm, threw them inside, splash in the water, and swim around, climb out onto the jetty. They threw an 84 year old woman in the side. 84 year old woman. Because that's the way the discipline worked. Now, I mean, the local people, of course, gathered on the keys there. He thought it was hysterical, the funniest thing you've ever seen. But of course, it, it, it is funny, except it's not. It's terribly serious, because it's an indicative, it's, it's a symptom of this ghastly organization. And when, when I was interviewing um, former Scientologists, obviously, who know Scientologists who talk to me, um, they would describe what had happened to them or what happened to friends of them. And I, I would sit there in the mouth and I would say, what? Why did you let me do that? Why did you agree to do that? And they'd look at me and they'd shake their heads. And, and they were they were high quality people, they were intelligent, good people, worthwhile people. They'd shake their heads and they'd say, I don't know. I just don't know. And that's the way it was. You know, they, they get out, they can't understand what had happened to them with inside the church. But it, it mustn't be. I have no experience of it because it must have been an extraordinary relief for them all. Well, I'd be happy to take any questions if you, if you have any, then um, um, try and ask them if I can. Um, do you think if Elrond tried his scheme today in the age of the internet that, would have, that it would have gone anywhere? Would the internet have had an effect on, on 
his ability to uh, create well, a church. To embellish his life story, to, to continue all the, the lives of his military service. It's hard to know. I mean, the church did modify the lower of the a bit after my book came out. They, they uh, excised some of the more outrageous things. I mean, the, the grandfather was a branch of the court at the time, but that was, that was gone. But essentially, the, the biographer remained the same. And um, when, uh, towards the end of Robert's life, I'm sure you'll know this, uh, Jerry Armstrong dedicated some of his commission to write what was going to be the official biography. And he thought, and Jerry put a comment on my book. Uh, Jerry Brooks started digging in the files and discovered to his horror that actually what they said about the cover one wasn't true at all. They said, went to his voice and said, look, you know, we've got to do something about this. Well, we say this, but this didn't happen. And that didn't happen. And, um, you know, as inevitably what happened to him is kicked out and, um, and dragged through the courts, given a very hard and unjustified time by the church. So, you know, they still, they still uh, propagate the same stories. I didn't think necessarily that the next would have stopped him doing that. I wish it had been, but um, I, I mean, you know, my book has been on the net since it was published, in, as you know, it wasn't published here originally. Um, and, and I seem to be that I don't wish to make any particular claims to the book, but, but it, you know, it's, a, it's just a piece of investigative journal and it's supported throughout by documents from beginning to end. So it's exactly that. It's fine. Anyone can be able to do it. But, you know, it's not just convenient, I suppose. They still believe. I, I did a debate, uh, a live television debate after publication in the United Kingdom, and, um, and the church fielded three representatives, very attractive, amenable, uh, charismatic, articulate young people. They did, you know, the best job they could to defend um, the, the uh, Abbot's reputation. And I said to them afterwards in the green room, I said, um, do you really, do you really, really believe that my book is abortion? Is that your honest belief? And they looked me in the face and they said, yeah, we do. So I said, well then how can you explain, for example, the world of oh, I said, um, what you've got there is the false record, the records of the sheep did, and the true record is in our files. And it shows that God well, did indeed fight behind the lines and all fight for us and war. So I said, okay, here's my record. Let's see your record. And, you know, I've got nothing like that. I don't believe it. Let's think about it. it had they wanted to shoot the bronze record to uh, cover up what they were directly doing, would they have included uh, all the bad reports? Would they have included letters from tailors in demanding pain? Would they have recorded the courts of investigation? Would they have recorded the fact that you could constantly lose the command of the um, uh, vessel? You know, no, they wouldn't. They would be seen as anodyne. They wouldn't be oblivious. But, you know, they, that's what they want to believe. And um, it seems to me they can believe anything they want to believe, which is like a problem to the church. I told you to <laughs> And so it was never published yet. And I think it, 
as you now know, it is publishing. And I think probably the church thinks, well, what's the point of going through this whole business again, getting publicity to the book, and with the likelihood that they'll lose? They'll certainly lose where they did before. But I think it might be a good chance they'll also lose here if they try it. So uh, I don't suppose this is one, but if it was, we'll grab a touch it. And um, uh, I hope they, they won't do that. They, they haven't thus so far. And I, but I also have had no aggravation, which I got quite well. Can you uh, just in a few sentences uh, sum up their legal objections uh, that that they made against a why yeah. it should not be published? Okay. Um, the, the legal objections are all technical. They were to do with breach of copyright, breach of copyright, and breach of confidence. Um, at no court, anywhere in the world, did anybody suggest that anything in my book was inaccurate. Mm -hmm. That was never an issue. It's very frustrating for an author to sit in a court and they're talking about you know, whether or not my previous copyright or using extracts from his, his diary. His, his diaries have come into the public domain because they sued Jerry Marshall. And, and my argument was that you know, this stuff was in the public domain, so therefore I, I was right to be able to use it. Uh, they disputed that and had lost. Uh, but no, I mean, uh, I wanted them to address the real issue of why they didn't want this book published. And the reason they didn't want it published is obviously is a damaging book because it attacks the heart of the church that were there found them. And um, so it was a dangerous book for them. And um, I can understand why they wanted to stop. I don't think they should have done the things they did do, but apparently the legal process was, was um, not too extended. I remember sitting in a high court in London and thinking, just by the way, you know, everybody in this room, every single person in the room has been paid for his time. Except me. I'm sitting there, the, the most important, but not, not, not the most important, but the one who has most to lose here. And um, you know, the lawyers, the judges, the hours, the hours, um, we're all getting a salary to probably answer my back. And I was sitting there frustrated and pissed. <laughs> Say again. Non legally, outside the law, did the church bomb it? Did the church harass it? Oh, yeah. Uh, I, I went through the normal process of uh, every, non ending difficulties. Uh, I was followed everywhere I went. If they feel the right to take resorts using the same name, they tracked down my friends in, in Europe and America, trying to pick up dirt on me. They told the police that I was responsible for unsolved crimes. It went on and on. And then they, they, they went to one of my neighbours in London where right? I lived a few years before, and he had been asked to find where this detective was staying, Eugene Ingram. And I called Eugene Ingram and I said, yeah, OK, you're finding the one I'm Russell Miller, but I'm Russell Miller, ask away, I'll ask, answer any questions. What are you trying to prove? So he said, I won't, I won't go into the details of this, but he said, I, I know that you murdered Dean Reed. Uh, Dean Reed was an American that defected to East Germany, who had died when I happened to be in Berlin. Anyway, but they, they wanted to prove that I'd murdered a, an American citizen in East Berlin. And the reason they thought it was, that I was so surely responsible for was because, first of all, I was a journalist. Secondly, they discovered somehow that my wife was born in East Germany. I was in Berlin, trying to get into East Berlin at the time when this uh, American defector had died. So they claimed to be murdered, which is innocent. But um, that was a subsequent So in their minds, in the sort of paranoid state, paranoid state of the church, it made perfect sense. Right. I was clearly either working with MI6, or the Stasi, or the FSB, who was the uh, successor to KGB. Perfect sense for them. It didn't make a lot of sense to me, but <laughs> so yes, there was a, a lot of parachute. Forty thousand copies of the book out in the United States and went to public institutions and libraries and stuff. And they were then uh, pretty much rapidly stolen. Like I, I know it was still the book, but some people did. Some people did. And um, and then then the books were put behind the counter saying that they had special applications for it, and then they put an the insert in saying you want to know about something you go to this book. Rubbish you should read, you know, blah, blah, blah. So the harassment went on uh, for a period of about uh, two and a half years. They said my house was under surveillance, my mail was intercepted, the phone was tapped, on and on and on. And I, at that time I had young children and I had to go to the school and say to the teachers, you know, uh, 
people might start spreading stories about it, and uh, this is what's going on. And it's very, it's very debilitating. I mean, one of the crises I had for me, it was wretched for my wife, it was completely innocent. You know, a young mother trying to bring up two children, and thinking that somebody's watching her all the time. Uh, there's a horrible thing to go through, I'm sure a lot of people here have gone through some of the experience. So it isn't pleasant, and it's not something uh, that you would normally say to the church. Uh, Dallas, um, Dallas was picking up at the airport last night, said, uh, the extraordinary thing to me is that uh, I belong to a church, uh, and they never asked me for money, they never made me really take a course. I went to a Sunday school, and I was good at the Bible, nobody made me pay for it. And whereas, you know, this money making organization, which is the church of Scientology, is, is the people that they accept, that they're they're going to be made bankrupt. They're going to live in the church and lost their money. But I, my view is that the only, the rest of the debt of the church of Scientology is to get their money. That's it. Yeah. 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 That's the church. 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 Being sensible, decent, and, and caring for your fellow human being is a money making organization. That's all it is. And, uh, and I hate it for that. Okay, well, I think I can step down and take a drink. Thank you very much for being here.